people of Earth. We have come to upgrade your cosmic consciousness. DNA activation ready in three, two, one. Hi, welcome to Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership. I'm Lou Quinto. And I'm Craig Anderson. Craig, today I, I thought it would be interesting for us to bring on a peer, uh, another executive coach who approaches coaching from a different perspective or a different way than I think you and I do. Uh, so I, I, I hope it will give us the opportunity to really explore some of the things that really help make executive coaching successful. So today our guest is going to be Vanessa Tennyson. And Vanessa is from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And she her organization is Capitalize Your Humanity. And one of the things I think you and I will find interesting is that she spends time at the very beginning of her engagement with an executive in getting them to understand who they are before she actually starts working with them on getting them to improve their leadership's ability. So let's go ahead and bring on Vanessa Tennyson. Well, welcome, Vanessa Tennyson. It is so good to have you on Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership with Craig and I. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Fantastic. Well, why don't we start off for our viewers and listeners? We're going to be talking a, a little bit about your, well, not a little bit, a lot about your approach <laughs> to executive coaching. And uh, as as we have talked prior to us getting on this podcast, uh, Craig has his way, I have my way, and you have a way that is so unique. And uh, you know, our, our introduction came through a former guest of Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership, John Bo. Uh, and uh, John sent me an email and said that if you don't interview Vanessa on your podcast, you're an idiot. And so this is for John. I'm not an idiot, John. <laughs> <laughs> Proving this as we go. Exactly. So, <laughs> Vanessa, why don't you give us a, a little bit of the history, your corporate history and, and your experience before you got into consulting? Sure. Thank you. Um, I spent uh, 32 years running an engineering consulting firm. Uh, so I was all the C's except CEO. Uh, I was the only non-engineer. Uh, it was about a $25 million firm that just did mechanical electrical design consulting. And so the operations, the finance, the HR, everything that had to do with a company and running it was my bailiwick. And, and so I spent 32 years there, a uh, mid-sized company, one of the top uh, 25 engineering firms in the country by size. Um, and then prior to that, I had spent a, a few years at Control Data Corporation, which mm -hmm. only those of us boomers who are old enough to remember Seymour Cray and, and his nemesis, uh, Control Data. Um, I spent a few years in international finance. Uh, and so uh, I gained a really uh, trial by fire background of accounting and finance for a high international corporation. And then prior to that, I had actually spent a few years in financial services consulting. So I got a, a big taste of benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so my background is pretty diverse in terms of Nonprofit, public, private, big, small, in between. And that's the way I like it. Um, as my mom would say, you're my little Gemini twin and you just can't sit still for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think as you and I talked in the in a pre uh, podcast uh, talk that you and I had, uh, you, we're we're both going to die on the job, right? <laughs> there is no such thing as retirement. Yeah, right? we'll just find a little pile of ashes on our desk and go. Oh, he, he finally imploded. <laughs> <laughs> like 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 the infant like the infamous phoenix. We'll just That's right. burn. That's right. up. Yeah, and go away. So, that, well, that's great. So you have now been actually doing executive coaching for how long, Vanessa? I, I've been coaching actually for quite some time, probably 20, 25 years. I've been a professional coach uh, since 2018. Okay. Um, uh, when I started my company, Capitalize Your Humanity. And um, as it turns out, uh, I, was, I was in recuperation from my transition surgery as a transgender woman. And, you know, that first month, you're basically in bed the whole time. And it was interesting to me because all of a sudden this creative stuff started to come up for me because you don't have anything else to do. You're literally prone. And um, Capitalize Your Humanity just jumped into my head. 
and I designed the logo and I brought it out to my wife and I said, what do you think? She's like, uh, you know, what design firm did this? I said, <laughs> I said no, I said, capitalize, you know, people think it's about money. Well, one of the alternative Webster dish, um, uh, definitions of capitalize is to make the most of. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the firm actually stands for to make the most of your humanity. And that rang true with me about all my years of experience. Really, all I cared about was helping people. Mm -hmm. That was my job. Right. Um, and people have been coming to me for help since I was, you know, young, very young, uh, just a natural magnet for people to say, hey, what do you think? What should we do? Can we problem solve, et cetera, et cetera. And so coaching, uh, it became just a natural extension of my encore career. Sure. I mean, as a chief operating officer for a major engineering, you know, firm and, you know, it, it's most of your job is mm -hmm. coaching individuals for success of the operation. So you did that nice transition all the way from the corporate side to, okay, let me help everybody out on an individual side and obviously capitalizing on your financial fortune to be able to be successful. That's Thank fantastic. You. Good, Thanks. good. Well, as I said uh, in, in our introduction, you approach coaching a little differently. And Craig, you told a story in the green room about uh, it, working with clients who don't want to be helped. You want to just fill everybody in on that green room conversation that we had. <laughs> well, it's just the idea that we talked about that some people seek out coaching because they want to improve themselves. They want to be better at performing in some aspect of their job, personally or professionally. Other times we as coaches are asked to, hey, this person is bad at this. We're about to fire this person. We want you to come in and fix them. People right. tend not to want to be fixed against their own desires. And so they're not engaged in the coaching relationship. And it's really hard to make movement and change. So I was just going on probably a much ad nauseum more than this about how I really <laughs> prefer working with people who want to be coached. Sure. And, and I think that aligns very interestingly, Vanessa, with the way you approach coaching. Right, right. So Vanessa, d d describe for our viewers and listeners, uh, we'll start with your triad of discovery, because that truly is, uh, is a significant foundation for your coaching with everyone. And the thing that piqued my interest was that, that term you have, this behavioral authenticity. Uh, thanks, Luke. Yeah, um, my Columbia or my coaching certification was at Columbia University in New York City, and uh, it's a graduate level program, um, and they treat it just like you know any other graduate level program. It requires a thesis uh, to have a, a, a research project, and and my research project I chose was coaching LGBTQ people in corporate America, and it turns out there wasn't any research on that. Uh, and, and you would think, you know, with gay and lesbian people having been in corporate America for, you know, millennium, that someone would have actually done some research on it. Well, it turns out no one had. And so my professors are pretty excited. Um, as I started to, to conduct my research, um, what I found out was that most all of the LGBTQ population was stuck in one of two places, in the closet or out of the closet. And as I started to, to process through that data, it became apparent to me that the big item here was what I coined behavioral authenticity. Mm -hmm. And behavioral authenticity is merely the concept of being yourself, your true self, no matter where you are, no matter who you're with, no matter what situation you're occurring in, is you're just bringing who it is that you truly are. And with some people, well, with most people actually on client basis, my very first session, I'll start with five power adjectives to describe yourself. And people are like, you know, no big deal. I said, oh, yeah, let me know that when you finish with the five. Uh, <laughs> I said, this is simple, but it's not easy. And, and I said, no, I want power words. I don't want happy, nice, kind, pretty. I said, I want moral. I want intrinsic value. I want stuff that when you say that word, it paints a picture. And suddenly people had a hard time coming up with five adjectives. Once we went through that process, then I asked them to actually paint the picture. So put that word in a sentence describing your true self. When we get through with that exercise, people have a much clearer definition of their behavioral authenticity. It's who they are as they show up when they're not thinking about it, when they're just being. And so the triad of discovery was developed as a result of that, that behavioral authenticity being the critical link 
And then the, the pyramid or the triangle as, as it is on the one side, on the right side is enhanced performance. And then across the bottom is uh, diversity of thought. And you know it comes down and then moves back and forth all the time. And the enhanced performance part was intuitive to me. But I did find research because like there's got to be something out there. What well, turns it out now in 2015, I conducted a survey of, 50, of 11 countries, um, 56 different companies. And they found what they surveyed for was people who were in the closet and people who were out of the closet and their performance indicators. And what they discovered was that in the United States, so one of the 11 countries, there was a 30% improvement in performance for people who were out of the closet versus those that were in. And my research suddenly had legs. I'm, I'm like, okay, I can point to behavioral authenticity actually engaging you in a higher level of performance because you've got all this energy that you were applying to being this thing in, in whatever place you were, that's gone. You don't have to think about it. You're just, you just are. Right. And then that slid across the bottom into diversity of thought because suddenly the lenses were clear. You could see things that you just didn't see before because you were worried about how you were being presented. Right, right. And, and it, it, it's, it, it's again, this, it, it's not just with the LGBTQ community, but you find, I mean, we all find that there's, there's diversity and, and people are hiding things amongst themselves, even if they are, you know, a, a straight white man or woman, there are secrets that they have that hold them back from actually being a good performer, such as maybe trouble with finances, it, it, things of that nature. So talk to us a little bit because you just, you deal with a variety of different clients. So talk to us a little bit about that aspect of it too. Some of those other things that hold people back. Great, thank you for that. Um, sure. I actually do deal with a wide variety of clients. I deal all the way from C-suite down to, you know, uh, the, the quote unquote average staff person in any company. Um, I don't draw a distinction with those. If people want to be coached and I'm available and they, they want to pay the right number, I'm happy to coach with them. And right. what I find is, so I had a client this morning and her struggle is she just wants to tell people what to do. <laughs> okay. And I said, well, if you were in the 1950s, that would be brilliant. <laughs> but unfortunately, we're in 2021 and that's not really going to work that well. So let's talk about, you know, why is that what you're bringing to work? Right. Where's that coming from? And so it really is, is about anything that's denying what you believe your true self is to be. And we get these things from childhood on up. Some of it's therapeutic, right? Some of it is, is this natural therapy process that has to be gone through with a professional therapist. But I find by and large, they're mere behavioral misunderstandings, right? An interpretation of this is, this is how I'm supposed to be, no matter where it is. I working with a client last week who said, I, I, I just don't think I communicate well enough to be an executive. And I said, I, I, okay, well, we're, we've been communicating for a number of sessions. I'm not sure what you mean by that. He had a very strong uh, Portuguese accent. And I said, I'm, I'm curious what that is. What's coming up for you there? My, my, my language is not that good. And I said, that's interesting because from my perspective, it actually is quite good. But from your lens, you're seeing that this is holding you back. So let's talk about what it is that you seem to think that others see when you speak. Right. And we spent a whole session in that place. And he actually ended by saying, you know, I had a staff member tell me he perfectly understood me and that he never had an issue with me. And I thought he was telling me because he wanted a promotion. And I thought, oh my goodness, right? That's behavioral authenticity. Right. Why would you not believe something because of something else? It, it makes no sense. It's not logical. But when we present ourselves as we are without hesitation, good, bad, and different, right? We mm -hmm. all have our stuff. We all get mad or you know, frustrated, angry, whatever it is. But that's who we are. That's why the diversity of people throughout the world is so important, right? right. If we're all straight, yeah, yeah, same, same, same. I remember my dad was telling me, he worked for IBM and when he was a young man and he hated hats, hated them, but he had to wear them as part of the uniform. Dark, dark suit, dark white shirt, shirt black mm -hmm. tie, hat. 
Mm-hmm. He, he yeah. said in his first year, he bought 30 hats because he kept <laughs> leaving them at the client's <laughs> office. <laughs> yeah, when you're not used to wearing a hat, you... Right? It's like sunglasses. I can't tell you how many pairs of sunglasses I've left places because it's like, oh yeah, get in the car and it, I don't know where I left them. So exactly. And so yeah. when I start any any client relationship, the very first thing we talk about is tell me who you are. This is a confidential conversation. It's not going anywhere. You're the right. only one that could break the bond of confidentiality. We're going to be open and honest, no judgment. So let's just be honest here, just frank. Right. Tell me who you are. What makes you go? What makes you tick? What do you like? What don't you like? I mean, we spend that whole first two, three sessions in, I need to know a lot more about who you are and how you bring yourself every day to whatever it is you're doing, whatever job, whatever avocation, whatever it is, because the more we know about who you really are, the easier it's going to be to then make that work in whatever field you've chosen to make it make it an, 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 a vocation or avocation app. It's like, right. well, you know what? You're a really strong, independent, creative thinker. I'm, I'm not sure what's wrong with that in any environment. Why are you holding back? Well, I, I don't want people to think I'm pushy. Okay, that's certainly a perspective. I see that what never prevent that? <laughs> God, well, It's because you're from the East Coast, <laughs> us, us Midwesterners. The Midwest, right. nice side here. <laughs> the nice way. <laughs> Yeah. Greg, you had a question. I well, so Vanessa, what you're really talking about is kind of that, I was going to say intellectual integrity, but it's really just life integrity that you're combining, you know, you're, you know, maybe in your personal life, you're very outgoing and you're funny and you're all those things, but you're IBM at work and your attention with yourself. And it sounds like what you're talking about is how do we get to a point with you? So you are not at that tension within yourself between these different facets of who you are and how do we integrate you? Is that, is that the idea of what we're talking about here? Brilliant. I'm going to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> that excellent. was perfectly well said. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the notion that we are our best selves. Stop trying to, to be something that you think someone else wants you to be. Just be yourself. Bring all those strengths, all those weaknesses, whatever it is with you, no matter where you are, no matter where you go. And I, I was being interviewed for a research project out in New York City, um, a, a visiting scholar from Warsaw, Poland, actually. And she was completing her dissertation on executive leadership. And she asked to, to, for me to participate in her research. And she just had a single question. And she said, so how do you manage being a woman, being a transgender woman, being a president, a CEO, a shareholder? How do you manage all those things? And I said, I, I I, I don't. And she asked the question three times. And on the third time, I said, I'm sorry, did I not understand the question? I said, I, if I'm at a softball game or I'm in a boardroom, I'm literally the same person. And she said, well, I'm confused because you're the 26th subject in my research. You're the first one to say that. And that's when I thought to myself, this is a much bigger problem than I'm thinking. And I have the benefit depending on your perspective of being transgender. And so when I transition, I don't have any choices anymore. I have to be myself all the time because the minute I walk into a room, I'm being judged. And so I have to be comfortable that who I am is genuine to me and I'm gonna present myself in that manner and allow people to observe, be educated, whatever. But I, acceptance is not my thing. That's, that's not my purview. That's yours to do or not. Right. My only area of expertise is providing curiosity, education, answers to questions that are open and honest and free of judgment. You come at me with judgment, I'm going to just walk away from it. I don't need that. I don't need to prove to you that I'm a good person. I already know I'm a good person. And, and so when and, I bring that. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and so many people do pigeonhole or segment their personal life and their professional life. And someone who we know at work is not that same person when you get to know them socially. It's like, oh my gosh, you're entirely different. 
Yeah, but, exactly. but, and we do it with things like our time. In, in mm-hmm. fact, you know, if it, it, since you brought up the boomer reference, I'll, I'll just jump on that bandwagon <laughs> while Craig laughs from the Generation X section. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we, I, I mean, in the early, or I won't say early, but in the principles of the Franklin Covey, it's like the 24 hours is all one time. You don't have a private calendar and you don't have a personal or, or a business calendar. Those are one calendars because the days are just one day. It's one week, it's one month, it's one year, and it's combined. And it, it, in so many instances in working with people, they believe that at work, they do have to be one person. And at home, it's okay if they can, and I'll use the expression, let their hair down a little bit. But that's not that that authenticity that you're talking about. That's correct. And, and I, I really like the way you put it because what ends up happening in our generation and before is there are two distinct personalities, one at work and one at home. Yeah. And if you remember, I'm sure you do, coming home meant decompression time. Right. I, I couldn't come home in the same way I was at work or my head was going to get cut off. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, who do you think you are? Why are you big Mr. Important here? Right? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'll right? give you, I, I mean, going back to when I grew up, my grandfather owned two auto parts stores and at, I, I loved my grandfather. I have his middle name. And mm-hmm. I mean, he was the most moral uh, person that you could ever see. I once used, I said, damn in front of him. And he came down hard at me and said, you know, you don't say that that's not right. And so I never knew my grandfather knew any bad words. And when I went to start to work for him on the very first day I went to start to work for him, I delivered a part uh, to a, a mechanic and it was a wrong part. When I got back, he was there at the door and he said, hey, you got to deliver this back. Go, go back and get the other one and come back. And so when I went back to that other place or to the mechanic, the mechanic said, just stop right there and let me see before you leave if it's the right part. And it wasn't the right part again. It was a wrong part. And so he gets on the phone and apparently he and my grandfather got into an argument and the gentleman, I'll never forget his name, was Ray. Ray just handed me the phone and I get on the phone and I hear F bombs and four letter words that I didn't know who this man was. And I just went, grandpa. (laughs) He just was like, "Uh, uh, Lewis, what are you doing on the phone? Because here I am, I'm 17 years old. I never heard my grandfather Mm -hmm. cuss before, but you're absolutely right, Vanessa. There, there was a generation where at work, you were one thing and at home, you're other. And even though we say it's a former generation or prior generations, it still does happen today. And I think you hit the nail on the head with that. It's just that the situations are more complicated. Right. And, and, and really where that moves the conversation is into empathy of leadership. Right. You know, because in the past, and we won't spend a lot of time there, but in the past, empathy wasn't even a word for leadership. It was direction and teamwork wasn't a thing. It was, I'm going to show you what to do. And then you just do it, do it really well. And, and now you can't run a company that way. I mean, first of all, they wouldn't let you, but what I'm finding is that more and more I'm working into this behavioral authentic place. And I'm finding that really what that amounts to is empathy for yourself and empathy for others as they're bringing themselves to wherever it is. So in this case at work, is understanding you know, the difficulty that everyone has, bringing themselves wholly to whatever situation they're in and trying to modify or mold it out and, and be something productive, right? And, right. and you know, because we all, we all suffer a bit and some a lot from imposter syndrome. Boy, I hope they don't find out I don't know what I'm doing, right? right? Yeah. And, and yet, when I was growing up as an accountant, you know, we did a lot, reverse accounting. I don't know how you got there, but I know what the answer is so I can come back with it, right? <laughs> Engineers do that all the time. They take something apart and see how it works. Yeah. They're like, oh, wow, now I get it, right? It's right. the same thing, you know? So, so when we bring ourselves and wholly bring ourselves, people can accept us as that thing, whatever it is. Now there's no, there's no mystery. Right. right? 
instead of making excuses for someone, oh, that's just Lou, right? It's, no, that's Lou. And, and you need to understand that that's who he is. And if you want to interact with him, you have to bring yourself in a wholly different manner, mm-hmm. right? It's not that Lou owes you something by being different. It's that you owe Lou something right. by bringing your authentic self and coming together and saying, oh, I accept the fact that maybe you're quick to judge. I'm not going to judge that myself. I'm going to say, I'm not that way. Right. I'm, I'm a little slower. I had, a, I had a former partner of mine in business. And after about 20 years, he said to me, you know, you make decisions too quickly. And I said, um, okay, so I make decisions too quickly or too quickly for your comfort. And, and he kind of paused and I said, so, you know, great statement. I'm just going to ask you, how many bad decisions have I made in this past 20 years? And he said, I can't think of one. And I said, okay. So it's actually not about me making decisions too quickly. It makes you uncomfortable that I make decisions so quickly. Mm-hmm. And it changed the whole conversation. Sure. Yeah. I said, I'm not judging you for this, but I'm also asking that you not judge me in your lens, right? I make quick decisions. That's just how my brain works. You take more time. You're an engineer. You take a lot of time to make sure everything is the way it's, I don't, my brain doesn't work that way. I'm going A, B, C equals D. Good. Let's move. Yeah. Right. That, that, that's Craig. Craig. <laughs> he goes with his gut on this issue. <laughs> well, yeah, but there's a lot of torture that happens before that gut goes. <laughs> so, you know, Vanessa, as we were talking through that, you know, Lou and I have spent a lot of time talking about empathy, especially changing with COVID, where we have this inside view of people's lives through Zoom calls, right? And their backgrounds and all those things. But what we haven't talked about is this kind of idea you're talking about of authenticity. How have you seen with your clients that you're working with that that authenticity has started to pull through? Because now we see their dog that sometimes is messing with Lou or mine that barks in the middle of the thing or their kids coming in and asking questions. You're, you, I always thought my boss had it all strapped down and locked down and together. And now I see my boss frazzled and hairy because they're having the same problems I have. Have you seen a change in the level of authenticity and leadership through this with your clients? Yeah, actually, it's, it's a great question, Craig, because there is a bit of a dichotomy for leaders in that space. What I have found is, and, and the best example I like to use are the, the network anchors, you know, the morning shows and all they didn't have professional makeup artists anymore. They didn't have the bright lights of camera of TV cameras. Suddenly their home was exposed, their flaws were exposed. And guess what happened? Everything changed. The whole conversation became real. They stopped putting on, oh, I'm on my news face now. They just became real people. And that's where that empathy started to kick in. People started to have empathy for them instead of seeing them as some kind of talking head. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this time and again with people is, look, when you want to understand someone else, you have to understand yourself first. It doesn't do you any good to try to provide sympathy for a situation if you don't know what the feeling is, the empathy underlying it, right? So as a, a transgender woman, I grew up for 50 years as a white male, right? So I had my white, pri- white, my white privilege, right? And I didn't recognize it as anything other than I'm working really hard. I don't see anything wrong with that, right? I'm getting ahead because I'm working hard. Well, I had the opportunity to work hard and get ahead. Lots of other people didn't that were minorities or in this case, a woman. So when I transitioned and I came to work as a woman, now I am literally the same person just with a different look my whole life changed. People suddenly started to treat me like I was a woman. And I saw the world in a whole different light. I had one of my partners come into me and say, you know what? Don't worry about this. I've got it. You know, you just take care of yourself. You've got a big burden here. We'll take care of this. You just take care of yourself. And I looked at him and said, what the F are you talking about? I have been running this company for 32 years. What suddenly makes me incapable of doing that? Wow. And and he said, you know what? I've been dealing with hormonal women all my life. No worries. And he walked out. And I went home and I told my wife, 
I just got out maybe 10 words. And she said, well, they're treating you like a woman. And I was like, oh my God, I've heard about this, right? All my life, never experienced it from my lens now. And it was this earth shattering moment where I was like, holy crap, that has to be a really tough road to hoe. And my whole world opened up. Yeah. I'm like, okay, it's time to just be who we are supposed to be and stop pretending that somehow the world doesn't look at us through a different lens. I can't control that. I can only control me. Yeah, it, it's something that uh, I tell a lot of people that, you know, we're so used to uh, going to our comfort zones and, and our friends are our comfort zones. Uh, mm -hmm. And I always tell people that if you want to start to feel uncomfortable, invite somebody next time to you, a, an event that you're having, a party, a get together, a dinner, whatever it is, uh, who is not in your circle of friends. And if you want to, if you want to feel what uncomfortable feels like, invite someone who doesn't look or talk like you. And the conversation changes immediately. Yep. And I, I mean, it, it is, in, it, it's, it's incredible. It, the dynamics mm -hmm. just really take, take over. Uh, what I want to do is in the time that we have left uh, is you, you sent me uh, a, a, an article that you uh, su are submitting uh, to to entrepreneur was it mm -hmm. entrepreneur yes magazine. Yep. yes entrepreneur magazine and one of the things that you mentioned here and, and that caught craig and, and my attention was the seven key areas of development uh that leaders can use to begin to develop that trust amongst their team and so in coaching executives in their leadership role talk to us in in a short i'll give you give us a reader's digest condensed version so we all go out and buy entrepreneur magazine and, and read it in its entirety but it. talk to us about the seven areas uh for development that you that you mentioned in this article oh, i'm happy to um these things just came to mind for me and, and through my experience, the number one thing to develop trust is proximity. And COVID drove this thing home because suddenly we were completely available, except one thing was missing. There's no face-to-face. -face. Right. The energy that you see when you are next to someone, the, the, all the nonverbal cues became, a, they were gone. You know, you, you had no way to connect with someone one-to-one -one by seeing them, feeling them, hearing their energy, you know, listening to them. And so my number one thing is proximity. Leaders have to be available face-to-face. -face. In the 80s, they called it management by walking around. And it was the whole notion that just because I'm the CEO or the president or the executive vice president, whatever your title is, that doesn't make me better than you. I need to be available. The second one is responsibility. Responsibility comes down to what am I supposed to be doing that you need from me, right? You have to be crystal, crystal clear about here's what I need from you. So communicating what, what it is that we are trying to do together. Um, the third one's reporting. And, and this is an often overlooked one. When do you want information from me? How often? What style? You know, are we going to be collaborative about it? Is it going to be a, a you know face to face, or is it going to be I'm going to report to the board, whatever? I want to know what those benchmarks are, so that I can make sure that I'm fully aware of the information that you're looking for, uh, for me as my part. So the 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 driver of all of this is culture, right? What's the point of proximity and responsibility and reporting if you have no idea what culture it is you're sitting in? Right. And so the, the culture of the firm is not typically driven top down, it's typically bottom up. And the leaders have to understand that change and any kind of leadership is top down through the bottom. Mm -hmm. right? I call it, it's top down, bottom up management. Right? I might have the idea, but I have to instill it from the bottom up, otherwise it's going nowhere. Um, the fifth one is leadership style. And this is where we get into authentic behavior again. Right. What style of leadership works? Does it have to be authoritarian? Do you have to be collaborative? Do you need to be empathetic? What is it that the culture of your organization is asking from you in order to get the best out of all the people? If you're in an empathetic, high collaboration firm, authoritarianism isn't going to work very long. People are going to say, see ya, I can go somewhere else. Because guess what? Mobility exists today. People can move and do move jobs. The sixth was collaboration. And it makes sense 
the word itself feels like what it means, right? It's we're going to be collaborative. We're going to sit together and decide together what it is that's important, what needs to get done on what schedule. Because again, I can't drive down my initiatives. I have to get them done together. I'm not going to do them. I'm asking you to do them. I have to have buy-in. So collaboration is critical. And then the last one, but probably the single most important in building trust is communication. And I tell executives all the time, you can never communicate too much. And they kind of nod their head. I'm like, I'm not kidding. Whatever you think is enough, multiply it by 10. That's probably enough. I said, you need to be visible and communicative and collaborative with an empathetic lens. Other than that, it's no big deal, right? <laughs> Other than that, it's just no big deal. Easier. <laughs> just check it, off the boxes. It's a piece of cake. Yes. A lot of people would say communication needs to come first. And I know Craig and I have said this in countless uh, podcasts where we've talked about communication. Uh, I think, Craig, you said it best that when you've, got, when, when you've gotten to the point where you're sick and tired of hearing yourself say it, say it one more time <laughs> because like chances like are somebody's going to get it at that point. Yep. So. Yeah. Well, terrific. Well, Vanessa, at this point during the podcast, what we like to do is we like to talk about key takeaways. So I'll start off with Craig. Craig, uh, give me your key takeaway uh, based on our conversation here with Vanessa. Well, two really. One is that I'm just amazed that you had this Mr. Gower from It's a Wonderful Life type thing going on <laughs> with your grandfather at one point. So at least you can get your ears boxed. So there's that. <laughs> so I'm glad about that. Uh, oh, second uh, is this idea that we talked about of having that integrity in your life where who you are is who you are across all the different facets. And I guess your takeaway in that, Vanessa, that the increase in performance and well-being that people see when they manage to pull that together for themselves. So that's my key takeaway. Yeah, my, my, key, my key takeaway is that when it comes to leadership development, and Vanessa, I think you said it best, is you got to get to know yourself first. You got to get comfortable in your own skin. You can't go out there and try to be uh, someone that you're not because people will see through that right away. In fact, I always like to begin that when I do uh, communication or pre presentation skills, I always start off with a quote that, you know, uh, people judge us by our behavior but we judge ourselves by our intentions. And sometimes those that intention and that behavior gets, gets a little off kilter. And you know, we wanted to do it this way. I, I, I meant to do it this way. But I, I like your approach of before you even start working with people is to get them to be authentic and to truly feel comfortable with themselves. It's almost like using a, a, a cooking example. Like you start, you start with them like kneading the dough before you make mm -hmm. the bread, where you're trying to get all the air bubbles out and trying to just get it flat so that when you then do put it back in the bowl and cover it up for two hours, then it can rise as opposed to getting that flat piece of dough or that, uh, Craig, as you said, that executive who, look, you're here because your boss told me or I, I, your boss made me come to talk to you and help coach you. And I'm just going to sit here and, and listen to you. And those aren't successful. You've got you've to have that want and that desire, but you need to know yourself. That's my key takeaway. So Vanessa, what's your key takeaway of your time on Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership? Well, first, this has been a blast. I, I, I love you guys. I, I could I get to hang out and have beers with you guys every night. It'd be very fun. Um, I'm going to use your baking analogy because it, it suddenly occurred to me as you as you threw that out that the coach is the yeast. Yeah. And, and the client is the all purpose flour. Right. right. And without the yeast, it's all full, the flour is not going anywhere. Right. No. And so as the coach adds the element that helps that person grow and prosper and thrive. You get to see the end product of this amazing loaf of bread that comes out from the oven, ready to go and ready to take on the world and be this amazing thing. I loved working with you guys. I would love to do it again. I just can't remember the last time I had such an engaged conversation. So thank you so much for that. Sure. Our, our pleasure. We're glad that you came on board. But before you leave, if people want to reach out to you, how, are, how can they get in touch with you, Vanessa? Thank you for that. It's uh, www.capitalizeyourhumanity.com or Vanessa Tennyson at Outlook.com. Uh, so type in Vanessa Tennyson, Capitalize Your Humanity, you'll come up. Okay. And, and you're uh, on LinkedIn. On yeah, LinkedIn. you're on LinkedIn and everything yep. too. So, okay, yep. terrific. You can't right. miss me. I'm not hiding. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> 
Fantastic. Well, Vanessa, thanks for joining us today. And uh, again, it has truly been a pleasure talking to you and learning a little bit about your style when it comes to coaching executives and through leadership development. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Craig. My pleasure. All Take right. Care. Lou, I enjoyed that conversation with Vanessa Tennyson. Lots to take out of that conversation around just all the things around us, you know, getting to know yourself better. I really love behavioral, behavioral authenticity. I behavioral really, authenticity. I really like that term that she that she has coined, uh, behavioral authenticity. And I love that idea of her first coaching client session is to have them pull out five meaningful adjectives about themselves. I'm not saying I'm going to maybe use that sometime. <laughs> not saying I'm not going to use it sometime. <laughs> Uh, okay, you're going to use it. I can tell. <laughs> Very great idea. But yeah, really great conversation. Hope everybody enjoyed it. So as always, you can catch our new episodes every Thursday on a variety of platforms from our website, qaleadership.com, our YouTube channel, our LinkedIn channel, and our Facebook channel, and all your favorite podcasting platforms in case you're back to that commute to work. Check us out on your favorite podcasting platform or walking your dog, however you like to listen to your podcasts. And make sure you like, share, subscribe so people know more about Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership. Until next time, Lou, I am Craig Anderson. And keep your hands washed. Keep your distance. I'm Lou Quinto.